Good evening, Vintage. I'm David Limbaugh. I'm on staff here at the chapel. Uh, I'm continuing a three-part uh, talk discussion on this phenomenon uh, that's contemporarily called deconstruction. Okay? And deconstruction involves beliefs, uh, hence why the title of the series is Believe. Uh, this is part two. We'll conclude with part three next week. So last week, uh, uh, Dan um, discussed uh, deconstruction. What is deconstruction? And he expressed a couple of ideas, including that deconstruction can happen to Christians. We can deconstruct our faith, uh, but this deconstruction can also happen to non-Christians, right? So deconstruction is a general phenomenon, uh, not, not regulated to religious belief or Christian belief. Dan used a couple of different uh, scenarios or narratives that he, he wrote in some creative writing class or something like that. Uh, he made some joke, I can't remember what it was, uh, that, that, help, that, that was intended to help us to orient ourselves towards this phenomenon, right? We want to draw a circle around the portion of reality that is deconstruction and try and isolate that so that we can understand better what people are going through so that we can uh, minister to them and comfort them and uh, maybe understand better what, what we are going through as individuals so that we can you know, better receive uh, the ministering of others. Um, I'm going to read one of his scenarios to help, help us remember kind of what we're talking about. So Dan spoke of Courtney, and these are, these are fake scenarios, right? So uh, made up, creative writing. Courtney grew up in a solid evangelical home. Ever since Courtney can remember, she had attended church with her family. Her pastor is a good man. He preaches the Bible every week and has never had any accusation of moral impropriety. Also, Courtney believes that all people are sinful. Therefore, all people are in need of a savior. Courtney attends a good church with loving people. Courtney loves her church. Courtney was homeschooled throughout elementary and middle school, but in high school, Courtney's parents decided to send her to a local private school. Most of her teachers and classmates identified as Christians, but there seemed to be a lot of inconsistencies. For instance, many girls speak cruelly about others behind their backs. In addition, some students cheat on tests and others refuse to help the foreign exchange students who recently arrived. Courtney left for college immediately after graduation. She went to a secular university and she, she was prepared for the upcoming challenges regarding her views of the Bible. She was prepared. But Courtney was not prepared to meet her lab partner. Hamad is from Saudi Arabia. Hamad's father is wealthy, and he is studying, the U, uh, studying in the U.S. as he prepares to take over his father's business. Hamad has a gentle spirit and treats Courtney with kindness and respect. He serves in the student union, helping students with anxiety adjust to life on campus. Hamad is a good person and expresses more kindness than Courtney witnessed in her private Christian school. Courtney is confused by Hamad because Courtney believes that people are sinful and depraved, especially people from the Muslim faith. Nevertheless, Courtney and Hamad grow in friendship, which causes great anxiety for Courtney because Hamad is committed to his Muslim heritage. Courtney now finds herself in crisis. How can people be inherently evil when Hamad is such a good man? He is such a good man. Courtney begins to question the premise, none is righteous, no, not one. Courtney finds herself questioning the fundamental doctrines that hold the Christian faith together. If humans are not inherently evil, then they do not need a savior. Courtney begins to deconstruct. So the, the, the intention, the reason I read this scenario is to help us orient ourselves to this portion of reality, this phenomenon that is deconstruction. What we, what we observe in the scenario is, is a process whereby a person begins to, to question or have a, a skeptical stance towards strongly held beliefs. This happens because of something that happened to them, right? In the case of Courtney, she met someone very kind who was unexpectedly kind, right, because of their background. But it could be something else. It could be abuse. It could be just growing up. It could be spending less time under our parents or guardians. There are many things that could cause us to deconstruct. There are many things that could cause us to, to, to shift or have our relationship with important beliefs be disrupted. Now, deconstruction is more than that. Deconstruction also includes being in, the, being in a state, or at least somewhat of a state of crisis, okay? So this, this relationship to our beliefs are, is disrupted, and now we find ourselves in a, a somewhat of a state of crisis. 
And finally, the third component is we now start looking for a foundation, right? We're looking for answers. So the relationship with our beliefs are disrupted. We're now in somewhat of a state of crisis, and we're looking for answers. That's the phenomenon of deconstruction, and that's, that's what Courtney is experiencing in the scenario that I laid out. Um, I expect this to be something that you're familiar with, or at least know people who have gone through this to varying degrees, right? Because it can look different in different people's lives depending on what they've gone through. So deconstruction can lead to, to reconstruction, right? So, so I've got this messed up relationship to my beliefs, meaning I'm at least skeptical of my beliefs, looking for a foundation, I'm in a little bit of a crisis, and now I start finding answers, and I start building my beliefs back up, right? I'm reconstructing. There are two different ways this can go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one is deconversion, right? So deconstruction is different than deconversion. There, there are two different processes. And deconstruction doesn't always lead to deconversion, but it can. And what I mean by deconversion um, isn't that somebody necessarily loses their salvation or something like that. What I mean is that they, they cease to participate in the practices of the Christian religion, right? They stop going to church. They stop speaking Christianly. They stop reading their Bible. They disassociate with their Christian community, things of that sort, right? Now, it may be that God calls them back, and, and they, in the end, they persevere, but there's this appearance of, of perhaps never having been a Christian at all, right? And we have this deconstruction leading to deconversion. The other path of deconstruction, however, is discipleship. And this may sound a little bit unexpected because we think of deconstruction, when we think of it, we think of questioning, we think about something bad. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be bad, except in so much that it's a crisis. Typically being in a crisis isn't a great thing, but sometimes, oftentimes maybe, depending on how we go through it, a crisis can yield great fruit. This is very scriptural. Think of the beginning of James. Count it all joy as we fall into trials of various kinds, right? Why? Because it, it results in all kinds of wonderful things involving our character and relationship with God. And we see this elsewhere. So, so deconstruction can lead to discipleship. It can lead to a person reconstructing, reconstructing a set of beliefs that are more firm and more accurate and more true and more profitable to a flourishing life in Christ than what they had before. It can result in a person becoming more like Christ and becoming a greater ability to live how Jesus teaches us to live, right? So two paths. We have, on the one hand, the path of deconversion, and the other hand, the path of discipleship. Um, okay. So, so how do we determine which path we're on? And, and how, do we, how do we get on the path of discipleship, right? I know I'm speaking to Christians here. How do we do that? Well, we do that by striving to be good knowers. Now, what is a good knower? Well, a good knower is a person who is good at acquiring beliefs that are true. All right? A good knower is someone who is responsible with his or her beliefs. And they, and they, they hold them for the right reasons and seek, seek to hold more for the right reasons. A good knower is, is someone who, who potentially doesn't, doesn't know very many true things, but will steadily acquire more true beliefs, and in time, and later in life, will know very many true things, because they're good at acquiring true beliefs, right? This is a good knower. Uh, you might also think of this as a virtuous knower, or someone with epistemic virtue, or someone who is Christ-minded. Someone who is Christ-minded is going to, to seek the truth, even if they don't currently believe many true things, for whatever reason, they're going to get there because they take seeking the truth seriously and they have the qualities required to follow through. And we're going to talk about some of those qualities in a minute. But let me ask you this. Why do we want to be good knowers? Why do we want to know the truth? I'm just going to give you a couple points here. Um, one is just that there seems to be something attractive about participating in reality how it is and seeking to do that. There, there's something very off-putting about discovering that you have been participating um, in a false reality. Uh, let me give you a, a thought experiment here. Um, imagine, imagine that you believe that you won some award, right? Say there's like the most awesome person at Vintage Award, right? Um, and, you, and you won, congratulations. We should all clap, right? 
you, and you, at least you believe that you won. Well, here's two, there's two different ways this can go. Uh, maybe you actually won, right? And your belief is true. That's awesome, right? Or maybe you were lied to and you didn't win. But here's the thing, you'll never know. You'll go the rest of your life thinking that you won the award, but you didn't. It seems like the scenario where you actually won the award is better, right? Because even if the lives are near identical in the scenarios, because you never find out that you were lied to, there's something very off-putting about, about living, living in a false reality, right? And so, and so the truth is attractive. Seeking, seeking the truth, living a true reality is attractive. Um, all right. I'm going to have more to say about that, but I'm going to give you some examples of bad knowers first to help us um, understand better what I'm saying. I'm going to give you some examples from Scripture here. So I'm going to go to John 8, 42 through 47. You can just listen to me speak, uh, but you're also welcome to look it up. Um, if God were your father, this is, so this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, right? And he, he has been trying to explain to them who he is and what's going on, and they just won't have it. And Jesus, he's at a point where he's like, okay, I'm just going to lay it out for you and just, just tell you that you're being obstinate because you don't seem to care about the truth. And this is how he puts it. He says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you do not understand what I say? It is because you cannot hear my word, right? He's saying you can't hear the truth. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So they're not truth-seeking. They're seeking to fulfill the desires of, of someone else instead, right? He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, or in some translations, he speaks his native tongue, right? The devil speaks the language of lies, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And so he's, he's impressing upon the Pharisees. He's like, look, I am speaking the truth to you, and you need to consider that maybe you can't hear me because you're not truth-seeking. You're not a good knower, and you're wrapped up in fulfilling the desires of the devil, which isn't truth-seeking behavior. So you're, you're selecting what you know, or I'm sorry, you're selecting what you believe, not, not based on a rational criteria that's looking for reality, but based on what can fulfill the desires of your father, the devil. And that's a bad criteria for belief, and hence they are bad knowers. Romans 1, 18, 18 through 23 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts, foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So here we have people, we, we hear about a people who, who, who know many true things, know many true things about God because they, it's been clearly revealed to them. But they're more interested in fulfilling their desires and chasing these things that they want, and these things that they find attractive because of their unrighteousness, than, than keeping their true beliefs. And so the criteria for forming beliefs becomes about fulfilling their own desires. What do I have to believe to get what I want? What do I have to believe to fulfill my desires? This is a bad criteria for truth. And it leads us to desires that destroy our lives, right? It's not always a good thing to get what you want. Okay, so these are two examples from Scripture of, of bad knowers. We want to be good knowers. We want to be knowers that seek the truth and have a criteria that, that helps us to gain more true beliefs that orient us towards reality. So we do this because as Christians, we believe that knowing the truth will lead to a better life, both, both now and, and when we die in, in, in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, 
We are also called to be good knowers. Romans 12, 2, uh, Paul says this. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So to discern is to detect what's true. It's to detect what's real. When we discern well, we know the reality of God's will. When we discern well, we know the reality of what's good and perfect. Goodness by its nature is to be enjoyed. So to discern well, if it's to discern what's good and perfect and what's at the center of God's will, to discern well is to discern what, what can rightly be enjoyed. And if this is a foreign concept to you as a Christian, I, I encourage you to, to seek out what this means and seek out more of the beauty of the Christian life and the, the fulfillment and flourishing that can come from the Christian life. Talk to your leaders. Um, get, get into that because it's important. Okay. So that's a bit about a good knower and why we want to be good, good knowers. Um, for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about what it takes to be a good knower. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through um, three different sections that somewhat build on one another. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of beliefs, faith, and fear. I'm going to talk about the difference between possibility and plausibility. And then I'm going to conclude uh, by discussing the fruit of the Spirit and the relationship between the fruit of the Spirit and being a good knower. So, so let's start with belief, faith, and fear. So to be a good knower, you need to manage your beliefs with faith and not fear. Now, I'm going to tell you what I mean by faith in a minute. And it, maybe it'll be different than what you're thinking. Or maybe you're right there with me. I guess we'll find out. But before I do that, let me, let me talk to you about what I mean by belief. So a person has a belief when that person has a thought that would be wrong if that thought doesn't match reality. Okay? So, so beliefs, beliefs are these mental phenomenon that are, that are trying to fit reality. If I have a belief about the number of chairs in the room, then that belief is, is trying to fit and conform to the number of chairs in the room. And if it doesn't, the belief is wrong, right? This is, this is what beliefs are, right? And beliefy thoughts do these, these kinds of things. They try and conform to reality. The purpose of a belief is to, is to guide you through reality. So I have a number of beliefs, right? And these beliefs are helping me to not fall off the stage right now and not walk into the table, right? I'm kind of on autopilot, but the, I still have beliefs that are guiding my body and helping to move through, move through this space and allowing me to continue to talk and to gesture and not fall off the stage. If I had false beliefs, then I might be in some kind of danger, right? <laughs> As I almost fall off the stage. Um, but thankfully, I don't. At least not, not the relevant false beliefs that are going to put me in danger have me fall off the stage. Um, well, this, this works for our life broadly. Um, my beliefs help me travel through life in all kinds of different ways, whether it be you know, making decisions with my wife about our family, uh, decisions at work, deciding when I'm going to get up in the morning, uh, and so on, right? This is the purpose of beliefs. They guide me through life. Okay, fear. What is fear? Well, a person has a fear when that person has a thought uh, that they, they don't, at least to some extent, want to match to reality, right? So it's a thought that... that, that you, you don't want it to match the reality, right? There's this, this tension, apprehension um, about it, it matching. So if I'm afraid of there being 176 chairs in the room, then I have a thought that, that it's not trying to match reality. It's not like that. It's not beliefy. Um, but rather, I, I don't want it to match reality. And it's, it's, it's bringing to mind and helping to, me to anticipate um, potential bad circumstances, right? So fears help us to anticipate potential bad circumstances. Um, perhaps I'm afraid that my car has been stolen. Well, my fear could help me prepare for that. My fear might, might result in me getting off the stage and going to check, because maybe that's good, because I need to get the police involved immediately. And my fear could help me do that, because I, I don't believe my car has been stolen, but I'm afraid it's been stolen. So I, I need to go check on my car real quick, if that's okay, you guys. Because I, if it is, I, we just don't have that much money, so we really want to get the police involved because we want to get it back. Okay, so I might do that if I were afraid because the fear is going to help me prepare for this bad circumstance, right? So fear isn't necessarily bad, but fear can get in the way, especially if it gets out of control. And more on that in a second. Faith. What about faith? So a person has faith 
when a person trusts in what they know to be true. Faith, faith isn't trying to match anything. Rather, faith is a commitment to act according to beliefs that are strongly held. Um, so, so faith is a, is a trust in what you know. It's a trust in your beliefs. And the purpose of faith is to allow you to act according to your beliefs, even when it's difficult. So again, faith is, is a trust in your beliefs. It's trusting in what you know, okay? All right, so how do we apply this? Why does this matter? Well, a person, a person can have a belief about some subject, but also have a contrary fear, right? So I mentioned this in terms of my car. I can believe that my car is in the parking lot, but also be afraid that it's stolen, which would then entail that it's not in the parking lot. And again, this can be, this can be helpful, right? Unless my fear starts to get a little out of control. So, so again, beliefs guide me through life. That's their purpose. Fears aren't supposed to guide me in the same way as beliefs do. But if my fears get turned up a little bit too much, they can start to overwhelm my beliefs and my fears can begin to guide me. Again, imagine I say I'm afraid my car is stolen and I jump off the stage and I go out there and check. Maybe my fears are, are, are doing something a little beliefy and they shouldn't be doing that because that's my beliefs need to guide me, not my fears. Though my fears can help protect me. So, again, fear isn't a bad thing as long as, as, long as it's under control. However, if, if fear is unchecked, then fear can erode the trust I have for my beliefs. And if I don't have trust for my beliefs, then my beliefs aren't going to be able to properly guide me through life, right? And so we want, we want to have a healthy fear, but we don't want fear to get turned up to where it starts to erode our faith. And so, so faith helps keep fear in its place, and fear can, can prevent you from acting according to what you know to be true. Okay, so do we have mics for people to talk? Is that going good? So can someone connect this to deconstruction? Because I just, I just got to this point, and now I'm thinking, how does this relate to deconstruction, this phenomenon that we were talking about in the beginning? So I want someone to help me out here. And if, if no one raises their hands, I'm just going to call on random people. I'm going to call on random people I don't know. I'm not going to call on Paul Hallman. I'm not going to call on, call on Michael Davis. I'm not going to call on Nathan Profrock, if that is your real name, Nathan. But I'm going I'm to call on you with your hand up. I think someone bring in a mic. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think it can relate to deconstruction because um, your fear, your faith almost gets tested when de deconstruction happens. And your fears can guide you instead of your beliefs, maybe. I think that it, yeah, that's great. What do you guys think of that? Is that a good answer? So clap if you think it's a good answer. Yeah. So, so that's right. So we can find ourselves deconstructing. So, so imagine Courtney and, and Hamad, right? Courtney is challenged by her experience with Hamad. But perhaps she has really good reason to continue to trust her beliefs in the Christian faith, right? That doesn't mean she doesn't have fear. It doesn't mean she, she doesn't have a lot of anxiety, right? But while, while it's perfectly reasonable for her to go and look into her foundations and ask questions and try and figure this stuff out, it, it would be a mistake to let her fear overwhelm the trust that she has in some of her beliefs, right? Now, that's Courtney's story. Other people, maybe something more severe happens, and the trust is rightly eroded, and you go looking for a foundation. Well, even then, you don't want, you don't want to be guided by fear. fear. Fear isn't going to lead you to the truth. And so it's important when you're deconstructing or dealing with people who are deconstructing to have them be guided by, by what they can trust, even if they're afraid, and not to fall into the trap of being guided by what they're afraid of or what they fear, okay? Thank you so much. There's going to be more of this, people, so pay attention. Stay with me. All right. Here, here's the next section. We're going to talk about plausibility and possibility. So it's important when deconstructing um, or working with people who are deconstructing, and it's important to be a good knower that you don't allow your fears or your, or your mind, really, to ruminate too much on what's possible, right? Instead, you want to concentrate on what's plausible. 
So, so what's the difference here? Well, a lot of life is, is this risk and reward assessment. We, we consider our circumstances, we consider the risk and reward of various ways of traveling through those circumstances, and then we act, right? So when, when assessing risk and reward, we must first consider what's possible. What do I mean by what's possible? Well, a rough and ready way to determine what's possible is to consider what you can imagine. If you can imagine it, then it's, then it's possible, right? Um, I can imagine all of you getting up and performing in unison uh, the silly string dance, right? Um, if that's a real dance, I'm gonna assume it is. But I can imagine it, right? Like, I can, I can see it in my mind's eye. You all stand up. It's like flash mob, and you're all doing the silly string dance. It's like something like this. It's possible, right? Because I can imagine it. Again, I can also imagine my car being stolen. I'm very, very worked up about my car right now. Um, but I can imagine it being stolen, right? So then it's possible that my car is stolen, right? It's a possible scenario. Well, well here's a question. It, it's possible, um, but is it, is it plausible, right? Is there some reasonable likelihood of either of those things happening? So, so everything that's plausible is possible, but not everything that's possible is plausible. Many possible things just have no reasonable likelihood of happening. Like all of you standing up right now and performing this dance in unison, I really want it to happen. But it's not gonna happen, it's okay. Because it's, and, and why would I think it's gonna happen, right? That would be a wild thing to happen in Vintage, to have the audience stand up and perform this dance in unison with no knowledge of, you know, presenter has no knowledge of that. Um, it's, so it's possible, but it's not plausible. Same with my car. It seems really unlikely if you look at the statistics of Getzville and examine the parking lot and everything else and type of car that I have, that, that it would get stolen tonight. So it's possible because I can imagine it, but it's not plausible. Okay, so, so when we're doing our risk and reward assessment, we, we begin in the space of possibility. We begin in the space of imagining um, all the things that can happen. But very quickly, we move into the, the space of plausibility, where we try and unpack um, what has a reasonable likelihood of happening. But what happens to some of us is we get stuck in this space of what's possible, and we never move on and restrict to what's plausible. And we get stuck there uh, because we let our fears get out of control, right? I, I assess my circumstances, and I think, my car could get stolen. And I never restrict and recognize that that's just implausible. But if I don't do that, then I begin to, to live my life and walk through my life making decisions as if I believed that my car could get stolen, right? And this leads me astray, and this, this results in me not selecting the right kinds of beliefs for the right reasons because they're true, right? And not because I'm trying to avoid fear. So we have to be really careful that, that we avoid getting stuck in the space of the possible and try and restrict that to the space of the plausible. Here's an example from my own life. When I was writing my dissertation, um, sometimes my advisor wouldn't respond to my emails very quickly. And I would begin to think to myself, he hasn't responded or given me any comments because he hates my work and he's trying to figure out how to tell me I'm kicked out of the program, right? This is like a thing that actually happens. It happens to a lot of grad students because grad school can be a little stressful. If I were to have done a better job, I wouldn't have gotten stuck there, right? I wouldn't have ruminated and lost sleep over that. Instead, I would have reflected and thought, that seems unlikely. He's always giving me good feedback and he's like a pretty nice guy. Um, I think he'd be pretty forthright if I was in trouble. That's what I would expect from him. But I, get, I got stuck in the possible and didn't move into the space of plausibility. All right. How does this relate to deconstruction? Just like one person. All right, maybe I'll call him Paul Hallman. Is that a, is that a guy in here? Is there someone named Paul Hallman? All right, oh, there he is, all right. Oh, okay, all right. There's no one named Paul Hallman here, apparently. So, okay, yeah. I, I think it kind of goes like, what are you putting your faith into at the end of the day? It's like, I mean, in deconstruction, if, if you're putting your faith in the, 
I guess, the right thing? Um, I guess, are you believing the right thing or are you being fearful? Is the way how I'm kind of thinking about it. Okay. So I'm going to try and translate that. Um, so it sounds like <laughs> if, we're, if, we're, if we're believing the right thing, then we are, we're focusing on things that are likely instead of just things that are possible, right? Yeah. So, I, oh, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, yeah, like putting your faith, for ours, like putting your faith in the, you know, Jesus, um, you know, being here or being and dying on the cross and then like raising again instead of like putting your, your whole faith on, you know, if the, if the, the world was created in seven days or the sub stuff that, um, I guess I other Christianity things. Okay, good. That's good. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease that out. Thank you for answering the question. Uh, so, right. So, it might be that I think, I grow up thinking that the world is created in six days, and, and then I go to, go to college, and I learn a bunch of stuff about uh, cosmology and things like this, and I begin to, question, begin to question those beliefs. And then I think, well, it's possible that if I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about it all, right? But then I have to consider, is that plausible? And then I have to consider the relationship between some of these beliefs that are on the edges and these beliefs that are in the middle, right? Like creation and Christ's death on the cross. And when I consider that scenario, I might consider that while it's possible that if I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about this, it doesn't seem plausible because the age of the earth is rather far removed from the mechanics of the gospel and the reason I believe in the gospel. So that's good. That's helpful. Okay, so let's move on to this last section here. Um, it's about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so this is supposed to be a group exercise, but we're running a little short on time. I want to get to Q&A. So I'm going to talk through this, and um, I want you to all um, think hard as if I was going to make you participate. But there's, there's several fruit of the Spirit, and I, again, I want to get to Q&A. So if you have questions, I encourage you to text them in um, to that number, which is going to disappear in a second because I'm going to throw a fruit of the Spirit up there or different, different pieces of the fruit of the Spirit. So first, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, uh, Paul tells us this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I contend that these things, having these things, help you be a good knower. So let's begin with love. So agape love, the sort of love that Paul's talking about here, it's talking about this undefeatable benevolence and unconquerable goodwill that always seeks the highest good for others, no matter their behavior, right? So you have this, this easy selflessness towards others. And if you have this, then this is going to help you um, select, select beliefs that are true. Because beliefs that are true, right, you're not going to have an agenda when it comes to working with other people. And we're going to see that theme throughout here. Without an agenda, we're going to be more ready to accept reality, especially because reality is going to be, is going to be Accepting reality is going to make it easier to help people, right? All right, joy. The joy we refer to here is deeper than mere happiness. It's rooted in God and comes from him. Since it comes from God, it is more serene and stable than worldly happiness, which is merely emotional and lasts only for a time. So if I have a, a foundation of joy, right, that's steady, then I'm not, going to be, I'm, I'm not going to be moved to try and take on false beliefs so that I can chase down some 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 sort of happiness or um, fleeting enjoyment, right? Or some fleeting pleasure. If I have this firm foundation of joy, this steady joy, then I'm going to be in a position where I can do the hard work of figuring out how reality really is. And I'm going to select those kinds of beliefs. Peace. The word peace here comes from the, the word Irene. I think that's how you pronounce it. The Greek equivalent for the Hebrew word shalom, which expresses the idea of wholeness, completeness, or tranquility in the soul that is unaffected by the outward circumstances or pressures. Uh, this word strongly suggests the rule of order in a place of chaos. So again, like joy, if I have shalom, if I have this wholeness, this contentment, then I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be afraid of the truth. I'm not going to be afraid of reality as it is. And I'm going to be willing, again, to do, to, to do the work required um, to take on more true beliefs. And I'm not going to be motivated uh, by, by a chaotic life um, to take on false beliefs, perhaps, this, perhaps thinking I can escape that chaos through, through falsity. So the word patience denotes 
lenience, forbearance, fortitude, patience, endurance, and long-suffering. Also included is the ability to endure persecution and ill-treatment. Describes a person who has the power to ex- exercise vengeance, but instead exercises restraint. So there's a stillness to patience. And in this last, that last point, um, patience allows a person to, to not seek out vengeance, right? So again, you have this maturity where you, you're, not, you're not motivated by these, these vengeful desires, right? Or if you are motivated, you have what it takes to refrain and to stay in a place of stillness. And this, again, allows you to not be moved by desires that might have you chase down falsity in order to fulfill these desires. And it, and it allows you to, again, select for true beliefs. So kindness and goodness. Um, kindness uh, comes from a word used to describe, uh, describe wine, and to describe wine as mellow or smooth. And so you can think of a person like this who is very calming, um, kindness is goodness in action, gentleness in dealing with others, benevolence, kindness, affability. A person who is kind is kind regardless of the other person. If the wine is mellow or smooth, it's going to be like that regardless of whether or not you're a rotten person or a good person, right? And a, a person who is kind is going to be the same. A person who is kind is going to have this demeanor and this attitude towards you, whether you're a good person or a rotten person. And a person like this, again, who has this kind of character, um, is going to be able to uh, withstand the temptations of um, chasing false beliefs in order to escape troubling people or troubling circumstances. Goodness is the moral quality required for the kindness. So kindness is the outward working of goodness. Faithfulness describes a person who seeks truth, is a good steward of the truth, who promotes truth in others. Um, someone, someone who has faithfulness has this robust um, trust in what they know, right? And I think it's obvious how that applies. Gentleness describes a person who has their passions under the control of faithfulness. So I trust in what I know, and I'm letting what I know guide my passions. And if what I know guides my passions, it prevents me, again, from going down these roads of seeking things that I know aren't good for me just so I can fulfill these desires that I need to train my, actually train myself out of. Finally, self-control is having mastery, and it's being able to control one's thoughts and actions. And this also, I think, speaks for itself. I mean, this is, if I can control my thoughts and actions, then I'm able to enter into circumstances that are challenging, and that could lead me astray and, and, and stay the course, right? Now, this relates to deconstruction because of the relationship between being a good knower and, and deconstruction. And if, if a person has these qualities, they're going to be able to better withstand suffering and challenge. They're going to better withstand um, the, the power of certain desires that might lead them astray. And, and this is going to result in them being better able to, to chase down the truth, even if the truth is disappointing in some circumstances or doesn't get them what they want. Okay, so the last thing we want to say is this. So those, those are all qualities of a good knower. You want to have your belief be guided by faith, not fear. You want to take be guided by what's, you, you want to think about what's plausible, not what's merely possible, and you want to chase the fruit of the Spirit. And this is because this, this helps you be a good knower, which then can help you deconstruct well, right? And then reconstruct uh, into the truth. And let me end by saying that Jesus is patient with you in these things, right? So Jesus' death on the cross has, has made a space where we can deconstruct in peace and deconstruct in the peace of the gospel. And this is because Jesus invites us into this perfect friendship, a friendship that isn't, um, it doesn't, doesn't need obligations or vows or something like that. Um, it's, it's bound together just because of the, the, the agape love between the participants. Now, God fulfills one side of that perfectly, and we do it imperfectly, but God is patient and waiting. God is a good knower, and God, God has the fruit of the Spirit. And God, Jesus, isn't afraid of your questions, and he's not afraid of you deconstructing. And so we should, we should remember this when we're afraid. Jesus isn't afraid, and he's patient to, to, to have us figure it out. And we should think about this when we lead people, when people come to us and ask us difficult questions. We should think, Jesus isn't afraid of these things. So I shouldn't act in fear either. I should act in patience and long-suffering. And I should help this person figure it out. And so if you, if you are attracted to that kind of peace and that prospect of deconstruction, 
Seek Jesus as your teacher. Seek to be his apprentice.